Welcome to Series 7, a learning tool from Securities Training Corporation. I'm Michael Quinlan. Each tape is designed to improve your understanding of a topic that is essential to your success on the Series 7 exam. Throughout this program, I encourage you to use the video technology available to you. Pause, rewind, slow me down when you want to review more carefully. As you probably have discovered, studying this material takes a lot of concentration, so you should take breaks when you feel the need. Allow about two hours to complete this tape. If you have questions regarding the topics discussed in this program, we encourage you to contact your local STC branch. You can find the telephone number in your study materials. If you would like additional materials or tapes, call 1-800-STC-1223. We have a lot of material to cover, so let's get started. The topic of the first part of this program is Advanced Option Strategies. Again, if we go back to a version of our basic diagram, we have the long call, the short call, the long put, and the short put. Now, these multiple option strategies that we will be examining in the first part of the show are going to look at two of these positions together in a single transaction at one time. So notice that there is a variety of ways that we could pair these things up. So we need to take a look at some of the possibilities that we have here. So for example, one possibility would be to look at these two positions together, the long call and the long put together in a single position. So we would refer to a long call and a long put on the same stock together in a single position as a long combination. So notice that it's those two options taken at one time. But let's take a look at an example and see what one might look like. In this case that we have here, we're buying an October 130 call and buying an October 120 put. What makes this a combination? Well, notice that the investor bought an XYZ call and bought an XYZ put. And remember from our diagram, that's what makes it a combination. Now, however, although the expiration dates are the same, the strike prices are different in this particular pair. Now, here's another example of a different combination. In this case, again, we have a long call and a long put on XYZ stock as we did in our previous example. But notice in this case that the expiration dates on the two options are different. Again, we have a long combination. And notice that we buy both options when we have a long combination. And we could also have a combination that looks like this. Like the others, it consists of a long call and a long put on XYZ. But here, we have different strike prices and different expiration dates. Now, another multiple option position that is the mirror image of the long combination is the short combination. In that situation, we would simply substitute sell for buy, and of course, short means right or sell. And in this particular situation, we have the short version of the combination. Now, there is an option strategy that is closely related to these combinations that you should be familiar with. On the exam for combinations, you may just have to recognize them, know what they look like. Now, here's an example of the second position that we want to spend a little bit more time on. Now, notice that like a combination, it consists of a long call and a long put on the same stock. However, the strike prices and the expiration dates are the same. Now remember, in our previous examples, something there was always different in the combination case. This pairing is known as a long straddle. So why would an investor set up a long straddle? It does seem to be a little contradictory. If you recall our basic diagram, a long call has a bullish attitude, whereas a long put has a bearish attitude. So now we have investors doing both things at the same time. Why would you be bullish and bearish on the same stock at the very same time? It seems a little unusual. So what we can do is to see how this works and what it does for us is to set up a paid receive chart, work through an example, try a few things out, and then see if we can figure out how the straddle actually operates. So let's set up the straddle we had in our previous example. In that case, the investor paid $800 to buy the 130 call and at the same time paid $500 for the 130 put. So again, we have a long call and a long put on the same stock and our example had the same strike price and expiration date. Now the total investment here is $1,300 in this case. So what might happen with this investor? Well, suppose that the value of XYZ stock begins to rise. As the stock rises, the put will go out of the money. Now remember that puts are in the money when the stock falls and puts are out of the money when the stock rises. If this is true around expiration date and the stock is going up, that will cause the put to become worthless because it is going out of the money. However, the call will become more valuable if the stock rises. 
Now, to offset the initial cost of the straddle position, the call would have had to return $1,300 to the investor. So what we need to do is to figure out would a 130 call be worth $1,300. Now, remember that we paid $1,300 to begin with, and we can't even break even unless we receive $1,300. Well, the 130 call would have to be 13 points in the money, which would occur if the stock rose to 143. So notice the difference then between 130, the strike price, and 143, which would be 13 point in the money amount. So the call is worth $1,300. So when the stock is at 143, the call would be worth exactly the original investment of $1,300 at a minimum. This would be the break-even point then. If the stock rose above 143, then we would have a profit. And notice that the higher the stock goes, the bigger the profit gets. So what will we say about the maximum profit potential? Well, it's really unlimited for this particular type of position. So, so far, we looked at what would happen if the stock went up. But what would happen instead if the stock fell? A call would go out of the money. Now remember that calls are in the money when the stocks go up, and calls are out of the money when the stocks go down and it would eventually become worthless if that extended to the expiration date. In that case, the put instead would have to be worth $1,300 in order for the investor to break even. Now, when would that occur? When would the 130 put be worth $1,300? When it was 13 points in the money. That would occur when the stock fell to 117. Now, if the stock fell below 117, again, we would have a profit on our position because the value of the put would exceed the value of our total initial investment of $1,300 at that point. So notice something unusual about this straddle position. It's not that you're thinking that the stock will go one way or the other, because you can actually make money if the stock goes in either direction, up or down. It doesn't matter to you. What matters is that we get enough movement. The stock has to move enough above the break-even price or enough below the break-even price of the straddle to earn an overall profit for this investor. The critical thing is that your return has to exceed the total amount that you originally paid for both of the options in the straddle position. So let's summarize what we've discovered so far about long straddles. And we could do that by using this particular diagram. So what this tells us here in the center of the diagram is our strike price. So remember that the key thing in the straddle is that both the call and the put have the same strike price. So that's convenient because we just have to worry about one number then. But notice another unusual thing about a straddle is that there are two break-even points, not one, like many option positions. One of them is above the strike price by the total amount of the premiums, and the other is below the strike price by the total amount of the premium. So if the stock goes above the higher break-even point, we would make money, or if the stock goes below the lower break-even point, we would also make money. We can make money in either direction. Now, where are we going to have a loss? only if the stock stays between the two break-even points. In other words, if we don't get enough movement in the value of the underlying stock. So as the stock rises above the break-even point, the investor's profits will continue to increase, and therefore the maximum profit is, in theory, unlimited. The investor's maximum loss would occur when the market value of the stock was equal to the strike price. Both options would expire worthless, and the investor would lose both premiums. So the maximum loss the investor can have in a long straddle are the total premiums that are paid out. We would lose both options. Now, recall that long combinations and long straddles consist of a long call and a long put on the same stock. The difference being that the straddle also has the same strike price and the same expiration date. Now, we'll look at another type of multiple option position that is essentially the opposite of a long combination. It consists of a short call and a short put on the same stock. So we're moving over to the opposite side of our option diagram. This, this would be called a short combination. In addition, if the options also had the same strike prices and the same expiration dates, it would be a short straddle. For instance, we earlier looked at an example of a long straddle consisting of a long call and a long put. And remember that they have to have the same strike and expiration date, which they do in this case. October 130, October 130. It's a long straddle because we're buying both of these options. If we sell both options instead of buying them, then we would have what's called a short straddle. So again, everything else about the contracts are the same, except we sold them rather than bought them in this particular case. 
Now, to help us understand the basic features of this position, it helps to go back to the idea that we saw earlier, long and short positions as being opposite sides of the same contract. Remember the long call and the short call? They both had the same break-even point, but the long call was thinking that the stock would go above the point, and the person who had written that short call was hoping that the stock would eventually go below that break-even point. The break-evens were the same, but where they would make and lose money was just the opposite. We can extend that line of reasoning to the example that we have here. If you understand the features of the long straddle that we just mentioned earlier, it's easy then to understand the short straddle by just thinking about the fact that they'll be the same break-even points if all other features are the same, but what will be different is where you make and lose money. So just like a long straddle, we find the break-even points on a short straddle by taking the strike price plus the total premiums and the strike price minus the total premiums. Note that that calculation is exactly the same for either one. What's different is where you want the stock to be in relation to those break-even points. Now, remember with the long straddle, you wanted the stock to be above or below those break-even points. So the opposite side for those in the short straddle would be you want the stock to be between those two break-even points. Losses, on the other hand, are also the opposite, where you would lose money in the long straddle, you would make money in the short straddle. So the profit and loss areas are exactly the opposite in these two situations. In addition, the gains and losses are exactly the opposite as well. Now, remember, how much money can you make in a long straddle? Theoretically, unlimited as the stock rose. So how much money could you lose in a short straddle? Theoretically, also unlimited as the stock would rise. How much money could you lose in a long straddle? Now, right here in the middle, it was the total premiums. Now, what would that correspond to in the short straddle? How much money can you make? So again, we have exactly the opposite situation like two people betting on the opposite outcome from a particular single event. So another way to look at this is the person who is long the straddle wants movement. Okay, they want the stock to go up here or down here. So we would say that they're looking for volatility. So what's the person who is short the straddle looking for? Exactly the opposite. They don't want any movement in the value of the stock. They're looking for stability in the market. They want the stock to stay somewhere in the middle as we've written here. Again, exactly the opposite attitudes toward an investment or toward the value of the underlying stock. So to summarize our discussion of straddles, let's take a look at these features. In straddles, the break-even points are always calculated, whether you're long or short, the same way, by taking the strike price and then adding and subtracting the total premiums. Notice that you have to do two things because you have two break-even points in any straddle. Now, with the long straddle, you hope that the stock will rise above or fall below the break-even points. So you're looking for volatility. In the short straddle, just the opposite is what you're looking for. You hope that the stock will stay between the break-evens. And so what you want in that case is stability. So those two types of positions, again, can be seen as a kind of just the opposite. So, so far, we've discussed combinations and straddles, and these contain a call and a put. So notice we're looking at our diagram on this side and our diagram on this side. And the diagram is very helpful because I know that this pairing, the left side pairing, is a long straddle. And what do the arrows tell me? I want the stock to go up or I want the stock to go down. I'm looking for movement. If I have a short straddle, what am I looking for? Well, the arrows point to the middle. I don't want any movement. I want the stock to stay in between the break-even points. We can see another way to combine two options into one position, and that is to pair a long call with a short call. Now, this is called a call spread. One could also combine a long put and a short put, and this would be a put spread. Let's look at an example. We identify this as a spread by noting that we are buying one call and selling another call on the same stock. At first, though, this might seem to be a bit contradictory. We've identified it as a spread, but again, why do you want to do this? Notice that if you buy the call, again, you're bullish, and if you sell the call, you're bearish. You want the stock to go down. Again, there seems to be a clash here between doing two things that are opposites in the very same investment. I mean, aren't you on one side or the other in a particular position? So we need to think, why would someone do this? Why would you buy both a call and sell a call, or buy a put and sell a put, which are opposites at the very same time? Well, to consider why one might set up a spread, 
Consider an investor who does only one part of this position. For example, suppose that you were just selling a call. Now here we have an October 55 call at three. Remember what this means. If you wrote this call, you have an obligation to sell stock at $55 per share if you receive an exercise notice. In return, you're going to receive $300 as a premium. You get that money up front. Of course, remember the danger to you if you sell a call. The higher the stock goes, the larger your loss could be. There is no limit on the amount of that loss. So let's consider, would you want to do this? Think about it. You're getting $300 up front as a premium, but the trade-off is you're taking an unlimited loss chance. That doesn't seem to be too good of a risk-reward ratio in, the, in this particular situation. Now, what we could do to solve this problem, perhaps, is figure out how we can protect ourselves. Now, right now, we have this obligation to sell stock. If the stock goes up, our big problem is getting it without paying a theoretically unlimited amount. Is there any way we could solve that problem? Well, one way to do it is that if you also own the call. Then, if you had sold the original call at three and gotten an exercise notice, but you also own a call on the same stock, you can turn right around, exercise this call, and obtain the stock not for an unlimited amount, but only for a set price. So really what you have here is a case where this option protects against an unlimited loss on this option. It really acts somewhat like a hedge. One side of this position hedges the other. So the reason for setting up a spread makes sense for an investor in that he gets protection. You want to do one thing with an option, but it has a lot of risk. And so you have another option, even though it seems to be the opposite, because that will protect you in case something goes wrong with the original option. It really is a hedge position. So that's what we have with spreads. Now, not just any pairing of a long call and a short call will do the trick. It's not every pairing that is a proper spread. For example, if we take a look at this case, the investor has sold a call and bought a call on the same stock XYZ, so it would seem to be a spread. The problem is, notice that the strike prices and the expiration dates are exactly the same. Now recall what happens if you sell an option and then buy the exact same option. What just happened? These two positions basically canceled each other out. One side closed out the other. So you don't have any option position if you do both of these at the same time. The only person who is really happy with this position is your broker because you pay two commissions and you wind up with nothing. That's not a good idea. And what we have to do is make sure that some feature of the strike price or the expiration date is different. That way, they'll not cancel each other out and we can have both options at the same time creating a spread. So, here is a long call and a short call that create a spread. Note though, that although the expiration dates are the same, the strike prices are different in this particular case. And this will be known as a price spread. That seems to make sense. The difference is the prices and so it's a price spread. But it's also known as a vertical spread. So you could be given a problem like this. Would you call this a price spread or a vertical spread? Either one would be the proper answer. Now here's an example of a slightly different type of call spread. The strike prices are the same, but the expiration dates are different in this case. So if the dates are different, what do we call it? Well, we call it a time spread, but another name for this is a calendar spread. And a third name, this is known as a horizontal spread. So any of these three terms could be used to refer to this type of pairing where the dates are different, but the strike prices are the same. And finally here, here's another version of a spread. Now in this case, both the strike prices and the expiration dates are different. So this is known as a diagonal spread. So one of the things that you'll be able to do is to recognize that you're dealing with a spread. You want to be able to say, here's a position, and now what is this? You certainly want to be able to distinguish straddles from spreads because they are really different types of positions. And as we'll see, they are analyzed in a totally different way. So identifying what the position is, is often the critical first step in solving these more advanced strategy questions. But we have so many terms here that could be interchangeable. We have price spread and vertical spread, time spread and horizontal spread. How do we remember all of these? Well, of course, things like price spread and time spread are a little bit easier to remember because you can just look where the difference is. But how do I remember that a vertical spread is a price spread? Well, there is one way you might be able to do it. For example, there is a type of options table that is used in some publications to describe what options are currently trading for in the open market. 
and the table has a list of premiums and other information. Now in this table, we have the name of the stock, that's the underlying, and then right underneath it, this represents the market value of the stock. Now this shows us where the stock is, and we can tell if the stock is in or out of the money. Now these are the various strike prices that would be available on this option. Now we're just using calls as an example, but we could have a similar entry for puts. And then we have the various expiration dates that might be available. So let's try to think about it. What could be a possible spread? What could that look like? Earlier, we had an example that might consist of, let's say, an October 50 and an October 55. Notice they both have the same expiration date, but they have different strike prices. Now, when you look for the premiums for those two options, notice that they're here, this one, and this one. How are they arranged compared to one another? This is a vertical arrangement. So if the difference is in the prices, then it's a vertical spread. Price spread is a vertical spread. On the other hand, we found some with the same strike price, but different expiration dates, such as these two. So that would be a time spread. But what else could we call it? Well, notice that this is an arrangement in a horizontal fashion, so this is a horizontal spread. And finally, we could have a case where we have both different strike prices and different expiration dates, so they'd be in different rows and different columns. What combination would that be? Well, that is a diagonal spread. So if you remember that kind of table, then you can keep those two, two terms straight when you're asked to identify them. Now, in addition to identifying spread positions, what we're going to have to be able to do, what you should know how to do, is identify several key characteristics of spreads as investments. Now, what we've looked at in our earlier problems for single options and in this program for straddles, what were the key characteristics that we wanted to know? Well, one of the critical ones was what do we want the stock to do? If we buy and sell an option, in this case, we have a spread. We want the stock to go up and we want the stock to go down. So sometimes we call that desired direction. What is the desired direction for the underlying stock? Another thing that we frequently ask about options is what's the break-even point? What's the point in which you have no gain and no loss? What's the point that separates the gains from the losses? So that is something we want to look at as well for spreads. And of course, we always ask, how much can you make and how much can you lose at most? The risk and reward. And of course, very important to know, we want to know in particular how much risk we're taking if we do a particular position. So we want to ask the same questions for spreads. Now what we're going to do is concentrate on price spreads. They're a little more common. They're a little easier to understand. And the rules are pretty cut and dried for that particular type of position. So we're going to concentrate on price spreads. And we're going to look at an example of a price spread and try to determine these key characteristics for this particular spread. Now the first thing we want to do is to determine what direction the investor wants to see the stock move, the desired direction. We determine this by looking at the option with the largest premium. So if we look at the two, remember we have two possibilities here. We have two premiums. Which option has the larger premium? Well, in this case, the larger of the two premiums is three. Now notice this three-point premium is associated with the short call. So what we do is to think back to our basic option diagram and remember that short call is in the upper right-hand quadrant. And what's the arrow in that quadrant? Well, this is a downward point arrow. We're bearish. So since the largest premium is associated with a short call and short calls are bearish, the entire spread would be bearish in this particular case. So we can use this technique for virtually any spread that's a price spread. Now look at the biggest premium and ask yourself, if I just had that option, what would my attitude be? Next, we need to determine the break-even point, another important factor. For price spreads, one key rule to remember is that the break-even point will always be found between the two strike prices. So that at least narrows down our choices of where we have to look at. But exactly where between the two strike prices do we look at? Well, that depends on whether we're dealing with a call spread or a put spread. For a call spread, the break-even point is the lower strike price plus the net premium. Now, by net premium, as we'll see, we mean the difference between the two premiums. If the position is a put spread, the break-even point is the higher strike price minus the net premium. Now, let's review these formulas by going through some examples to see how they work. In this particular example, we have a call spread. So we would find the break-even point by taking the lower strike price and adding the net premium. Well, what's the net premium? 
The net premium is the difference between the two premiums. In this case, it would be the difference between one and three, which is two. Then we take that number and add it to the lower strike price. So 55 plus two is 57, and that is our break-even point. And notice, just to check yourself on that, 57 is between the two strike prices. Now that is one way to check that you've done the calculation correctly. It's got to be between those two numbers. Now let's look at a put spread so we can review the rules for puts. Now in this case, the break-even point for the put spread is going to be the highest strike price minus the net premium. Here, the net premium is six, the difference between 14 and eight. The higher strike price is 180. So we would take 180 minus six, and that's 174, which is the break-even point. And notice again that this number winds up being between the two strike prices. So as long as you remember, for example, the critical rules that we looked at earlier, call up and put down, this can help you keep the right order and the right perspective. Because for example, if we're dealing with that put spread that we just looked at and we chose the wrong strike price, 170, as long as we remember to subtract, we would find that we had a number that was too low. It wouldn't be between the two strike prices, so that will remind us, no, no, I have to take the higher strike price for a put spread and subtract the net premiums. I call up for a call spread. I take the lower strike price and I add the net premium. So again, the phrases call up and put down come in handy to help us remember how to deal with this particular issue. It's also important for us to be able to determine, as with our other positions, the maximum potential loss on our position and the maximum potential gain. Now this process of finding these numbers for a particular spread, the price spread that we're looking at, is divided into two steps. Now for the first step, we'll look at an example. What we first do is to determine whether it's a debit spread or a credit spread. Now we'll go through what we mean by that by taking a look at this particular case. Now as in all spreads, the investor has sold one option and purchased another. Now the premium for the short option is three. The investor will receive this premium, recall, because the investor sold the option. We can represent that fact by using a plus sign. That's money in your pocket. Okay, we've received that three point premium. Plus, the investor purchased the 50 call and therefore paid the premium of seven. So we can represent that fact by using a minus sign, right? And that's money out of your pocket. You had to pay that amount out. So what's the net result? Plus three, minus seven. The investor paid out a total of four points. We have minus four as the net result. So whenever an investor sets up a spread by paying out more than receiving, this is called the debit spread. Now remember, you have less money than you started with because you paid out a net amount, so you have a debit. So we will represent this, just for short-term notation, by abbreviating it DR for debit. Now let's look at another example. In this case, the investor bought the 60 call for one. So this is an amount that the investor paid out. So we have a minus sign there. The investor sold the 55 call for three. So in this particular case, the investor will receive the three points. So we have a plus sign for that one. And when we net those two transactions, we find that the investor received two points overall because they received more than they paid. So this would be considered a credit spread. You start out money ahead. There is money in your pocket, so you have a credit. And we will abbreviate this for our purposes as CR for credit. So the first step in determining the maximum gain and the maximum loss is to figure out, do I have a debit spread or do I have a credit spread? And that is a skill that you should really be able to deal with among spreads to figure out if it is a debit or credit. Again, I'm paying out something and I'm receiving something for each spread that I do. I'm buying one and I'm selling one. So if I pay out more than I receive, I have a debit. If I receive more than I pay, I have a credit because I have money in my pocket to begin with. Now once we do that, the next step depends on whether we have a debit or a credit. If the spread was set up as a debit, then our rule is that the maximum loss is equal to the debit itself. That's the most that the investor could lose. To find out the maximum gain, we take the difference between the strike prices and subtract the debit, which would be the maximum loss. On the other hand, if the position were set up as a credit spread, the credit would be the investor's maximum possible gain. Remember, that's money in your pocket. You start off ahead with that. To find the maximum possible loss, you take the difference between the strike prices minus the credit. Now, these rules are important and somewhat difficult to apply initially when we look at them, so let's look at some other examples to review and illustrate this particular rule. 
Here, the investor has purchased a call for one point and sold a call for three points. So the investor will receive three points or $300 for selling a 55 call. The investor will pay out one point for the 60 call that was purchased. All right, you sold one and you bought one, but you sold for more than you bought. So the net result is the investor received $200. So since the investor received more than they paid, this is a credit spread. In a credit spread, the amount of the credit represents the investor's maximum potential gain. Now remember, that's money in your pocket. To find the largest possible loss, we would take the difference between the strike prices, which in this case is five points. Now remember, that's the difference between 55 and 60. That's where the five point came from. And when we subtract the amount of the credit, which we previously found was two, the result is three, which in this case would be the maximum possible loss. $300 from this particular spread. Now let's look at another example so that we can be sure how to apply those rules. In this spread, the investor is buying a put for 14 and selling a put for 8. Now, even though this is a put spread, we would apply the rules the same way. The investor would pay out 14 points for the 180 put. The investor would receive 8 points for the 170 put that was sold. The net result was that the investor paid out 6 points. So that's money out of pocket. Therefore, it's a debit spread. They're starting out $600 behind in this case. Since the investor paid out more than was received, we have that debit. The amount of debit is the most that the investor could lose. You have that money out of pocket, and that's the worst it can get, $600 in this case. So to find the maximum potential profits, start out by finding the difference between the strike prices. Again. That is going to be the difference between 180 and 170, which in this case is 10 points. That's where we got that figure. Then we would subtract the debit, which in this case was six or $600, and we would find the difference of four points or $400 would be the investor's maximum potential gain. So again, we can check ourselves when we get these numbers by doing something else. Take your maximum potential gain and add it to your maximum potential loss. Put those two numbers together and that should always be equal to the difference between the two strike prices. And notice, that's what has happened in all of our spreads so far. So these rules, if you know them and apply them in a correct way, will get you those critical figures for a spread. How much can you make and how much can you lose? This is an important thing, of course, for an investor to know for spreads. You can figure this out ahead of time if you know the premiums, what those two numbers are. So it gives you kind of a risk-reward ratio against which you can measure whether you want to take the risk or not. So for example, if you knew that you might make $100, but your maximum loss was $900, that wouldn't seem to be too good of a risk-reward ratio. But we could calculate that knowing what the features of the two positions were in the spread. So it helps us evaluate whether we're going to have a good risk-reward ratio and whether we're going to have a good potential investment. Now, there is a last rule that we want to address that applies only to spreads. Notice our previous rules, we asked about many other positions. What's our break-even point? What do you want the stock to do? And how much can you make or lose? This final rule is the question, so you want the spread to widen or narrow? And this is a rule that we apply only to spreads, not to other positions. The rule would be, if it were a debit spread, the investor wants the spread to widen. If it's a credit spread, the investor wants the spread to narrow. Now again, let's see how we apply this rule so we can try to understand what it means. In this example, the investor bought the 60 call for one. So again, we're going to be paying out $100 for that particular premium. The investor sold the 55 call for three points. This is the money that the investor will receive. When we net those two transactions, what's the result? We find that we've received more than was paid out. This would be a credit spread. Now remember what our rule said. If we had a credit spread, we want the spread to narrow. Now, of course, we want to get the questions correct when we come across them. So we want to memorize the rule, first of all, so we know which way to answer the question. And sometimes the question will be that straightforward. Do we want the spread to widen or narrow? But it is certainly easy to remember the rule if we have some idea of what we're talking about here and how this rule actually works. What do we mean by the spread widening or narrowing? Where does that come from? Well, let's look at our previous example and try to explain what we're talking about. The spread that a rule is referring to is the difference between the two premiums, which in this case is two points. 
Now, that's how we initially set up this position, right? Suppose that at a later date, the difference between the two premiums comes to 75 cents. And the question is, how can that happen? Didn't I already pay one and receive three? How can the premiums change? Well, of course, the premiums that we're talking about are the premiums on this particular series of options, which are out there still trading in the open market. And of course, the premiums out in the open market are going to continue to adjust, move up and down to reflect changes in the value of the underlying stock. So let's assume that at some date later on, our options have premiums of 25 cents and $1. Now, notice it's the same two options involved. Here is the 60 call. That's the one that we bought here. And here's the 55 call. And that's the one that we sold up here. But these premiums are what the markets say that they're worth at some later date. Those are not our initial premiums. Now, notice that this difference is 75 cents, which is what we're supposed to assume. Now, how is this going to get us the gain that we said we should have in this case? Well, the assumption when one sets up a spread is that at some later date, such as this one right here, you'll close out both of your original options. Initially, we bought the 60 call, so we'll close that option out later by selling it. Now, remember, if you buy something, you close out by its selling. We originally sold the 55 call, so now we will purchase it in order to close it out. If you sell it to start with, then you have to buy it to finish it off. Now, what will be the consequences in this case? Well, we paid $100 for the 60 call, and later we resold it for $0.25 cents per share. Now, remember, that's $25 for the 100 share contract. The 55 call was initially sold and received three points, and later we bought it back for one point. So now we're ready to see the result. The net result of these transactions, the investor paid out $75, so that's a profit of $125. Is there another way to find this particular information? Well, note that the initial credit of two points has narrowed to a final spread of three quarters of a point, as we mentioned in our earlier discussion. It turns out to be of no coincidence that the difference between the $2 and the 75 cents is $1.25. You're at $125. The spread did narrow, and indeed, you did make money. In fact, the amount of money that you made was exactly the amount by which the spread narrowed. So the amount of widening or the amount of narrowing is always going to be exactly what you make or lose. Now remember on our previous example, if the premiums had later on begun to spread farther apart than two points, the overall result would have been a loss for our investor. So widening and narrowing for spreads is very important. Now what we should do is to go back and these rules for spreads that are things that you may have to apply. And so let's review these four basic rules that apply to the spread positions that we've looked at. So first remember, we determine the direction that the investor would like the underlying stock to go. The desired direction is determined by looking at the option with the largest premium. We use rule number two to find the break-even point on a spread. Now remember that break-even point on a spread is always between in the price spreads that we're looking at between the strike prices. For a call spread, we think call up, find the lower strike price, and add the net premium. For a put spread, we think put down take the higher strike price and subtract the net premium. So again, the rule is a little bit different depending on whether you're dealing with a call spread or a put spread. Now, notice that this is really the only place where the rules do differ for call spreads and put spreads. The other three rules are exactly the same no matter what kind of spread, put spread, or call spread we're concerned with. Next, we must find the maximum potential gain and the maximum potential loss. Of course, that does depend on whether we're dealing with a debit spread or a credit spread. Now, if you start with a debit spread, in which you start by paying more money than you received, your maximum loss is the amount of the debit. Now, that's the amount of money that you paid out of pocket up front. The maximum gain is the difference in the strike prices minus the debit. Now, for a credit spread, instead, we have the maximum gain equal to the credit. The maximum loss, then, is the strike price difference minus the credit. Finally, we must decide if the investor would like the spread to widen or narrow. And again, here the rule does depend on whether you're talking about a debit spread or a credit spread. For a debit spread, the investor wants the spread to widen. For a credit spread, the investor wants the spread to narrow. This concludes our discussion of advanced option strategies. Stay tuned for our next topic. The topic of this part of our program is margin accounts. Well, what is a margin account? Margin account is an account in which a customer is going to make some kind of cash deposit, usually like a down payment, to buy stock on credit. 
We'll contrast this, or it should be contrasted, with a cash account. In a cash account, the customer pays in full for whatever transaction we deal in. Now, there are several different types of things that can occur in a margin account. We're going to initially start by looking at what we call long margin transactions. Now, this is where a customer is purchasing stock in a margin account. And we'll be focusing on purchasing stock in a margin account since most transactions that investors would be associated with in margin accounts would be of this type. Now, rules about how we purchase things in margin accounts and what we can purchase in a margin account are covered by Federal Reserve Board rules. The FRB, or the Fed specifically, they determine what we can and cannot do in a margin account. One of the things that they do is to restrict the type of securities that can be purchased in a margin account, specifically in the area of common stock. So not all types of stock can be purchased on margin. Stocks that can be purchased on margin or credit are called marginable stock. There are two main types to remember. All listed stock would be marginable, anything that trades on an exchange. In addition, NASDAQ stocks can automatically be considered marginable. So these two types and only these two types of stock can be purchased on margin, just like we would when opening any account. But in addition, we must fill out a second form, the margin agreement or customer agreement, which consists of several parts. The first part of the margin agreement is the credit agreement. Now, the credit agreement basically discloses to the customer the terms of credit in which a loan will be extended to them in the account. So it's just like any situation where you might go into a bank, for example, and borrow money from the bank. They would tell you what the credit terms were. That is what the broker-dealer is doing here under the credit agreement. So we do have to tell the customer the terms under which they're going to extend credit to them. Now, in addition to the credit agreement, the margin form also contains what is called a hypothecation agreement. Hypothecation is the process of using stock or other securities as collateral for a loan, and that is exactly what the customer is going to do in this account. So the customer agrees that the stock that they're buying in the margin account on credit will serve as the collateral for a loan that the broker-dealer is extending to them. So this agreement between the broker-dealer and the customer is called the hypothecation agreement. So we need this as part of every customer or margin agreement. Now the margin agreement might also contain what is called a loan consent form, but this is an optional part. It's not in every margin agreement. If the customer agrees to this clause, it allows the brokerage firm to lend the customer's stock to other customers who need to borrow it to sell stock short. So it may or may not be in any particular margin agreement. It is not a required part. But another part that is required is that the margin agreement must be signed by the customer to be valid. Now remember that the customer is agreeing to the credit terms. The customer is allowing their stock to be used as collateral and the customer must sign off and consent to that arrangement. Now, once we've set up the account, we're now ready to take a look at how transactions actually occur. Now, we're going to illustrate the rules by following through an example of a customer making a purchase of stock on credit, a long margin purchase. We're going to assume that the customer is buying 100 shares of XYZ stock at $100 per share in a margin account. So we've got $10,000 of total stock that we're buying at this point. Now, to track the customer's changes in the account as things progress, we will use a balance sheet to describe the customer's position. Now remember, a balance sheet has three basic areas. Assets on the left, liabilities and equity on the right. And like any balance sheet, assets must always equal liabilities plus equity. That is true of any kind of financial balance sheet that we put together. Now how do we apply it to a margin account? Now remember, this is the customer's margin account. So when they purchase the stock on margin, the customer will own 100 shares of XYZ stock in the account. That's what we're buying on margin. Since this is a financial statement, however, we must attach a dollar value to the asset. So initially what we'll do is we'll use the market value of the stock on the day it was purchased. Now remember, that was $100 per share, so it's $10,000. Now later this value will change. The stock could rise or fall. We will change this value later on to reflect the current price of the stock. It might go higher, it might go lower at some later date. Now typically we do this at the end of every business day. And this process is called a mark to the market, revaluing the account based on new market values. So it might be more accurate to label this asset sides of the chart, MV, for market value. Since eventually that's exactly what this figure will represent, the market value of that 100 shares of stock. The lower right side of the balance sheet shows us equity. Now remember that equity is what you own. In this case, 
This is the customer's margin account. So what kind of equities does the customer start out with? Well, it's the amount of money that the investor will put down on the purchase. And this is determined, at a minimum, by the Federal Reserve Board under Regulation T. Regulation T applies to margin accounts at broker-dealers. Currently, the Fed rule requires margin investors to pay 50% of the value of the stock that they are buying. So they have to put up at least half of the purchase price. In this case, that would be $5,000. So we will use the abbreviation EQ to stand for the customer's equity. Now, if the customer pays $5,000 of the purchase price, but the stock costs $10,000 overall, that must mean that the broker-dealer, on behalf of the customer, will pay the other half of the purchase price when the stock is delivered to the broker-dealer. So this represents a loan by the broker-dealer to the customer. Now remember, that customer doesn't get it in cash, but the broker-dealer uses that money on behalf of the customer to buy their stock. So we have to pay them back at some time. In this example, that amount would be $5,000. So notice that if the customer has to put up at least 50%, the broker-dealer can lend to the customer at most 50%. Now, this amount that the customer owes to the broker-dealer is called the debit balance of the customer. But we're just going to use the abbreviation DR to stand for the debit balance. Now that we've labeled each section, the basic balance sheet equation becomes market value equals debit balance plus equity. Sometimes we find that a more useful formula would be market value minus debit balance equals equity. And we'll be using this particular formula several times during our discussion of margin accounts. Now again, let's review what we have so far. And we've set this up like a balance sheet, and what we're hoping to do is to see the relationship, how it exists between the market value, the debit balance, and the equity in the account. Now, this is the value of what the customer owns in the account, the stock purchased on margin. Now, this is the amount that we owe to the brokerage firm because they paid it for us to buy the stock in the first place. It's the amount of the loan. And this is what we put up, at least initially. So this is our equity. So notice that if we sold the stock immediately at this point, we'd sell it for $10,000, 5,000 of whose proceeds would be used to pay off the loan, and the equity that we would get back out of the account would be the $5,000 figure here. Now, the important reason for setting up this arrangement in this manner is, again, the relationship between these parts should always be the same. Market value minus debit balance would be equal to equity. So that relationship always has to hold true, and it's going to help us keep track of the changes that eventually occur in the account. So now, we've only looked at one key rule covering margin accounts, rule of the Federal Reserve Board, which would be under Regulation T. But there are additional rules that cover margin accounts as well as the one we've just looked at. So, for example, the federal rule is 50% equity, which is what you must put into the account. But initially, there is also a second rule that we need to check. And this is a rule set up by the New York Stock Exchange and the NASD, the self-regulatory organizations for the industry. And they require that when you take a new position in a margin account, you have to make sure that the equity in the account is brought up to at least $2,000. However, the investor is not required to deposit more than the value of the stock being purchased. Now, to understand that requirement, let's take a look at some examples, because it is a slightly complicated rule. Suppose that a customer wants to purchase $3,000 worth of stock in an empty margin account. There is nothing in it right now. What must the customer deposit? Well, under Regulation T, 50% or $1,500. Well, the NASD and the New York Stock Exchange requirement says that you have to put up at least $2,000. And we always have to put up whichever of these two requirements is the greater of the two. So in this case, the requirement is going to be $2,000. So here's another case. The customer in this situation wishes to purchase $1,500 worth of stock, and we're going to assume again that it is a new account. There is nothing else in there. What is the initial requirement? Well, again, we have two to check out we have to come up with the greater amount. Reg T would say that you have to put up $750. Remember, that is 50% of the amount of the stock that we're buying in this transaction. However, the NYSE and NASD requirement is normally $2,000. Now, does that apply in this situation? Well, that doesn't really seem fair because why should you have to put up $2,000 when the stock you're buying is really only worth $1,500? If you did this in a cash account, you would really only have to pay $1,500. So in fact, in this situation, the initial equity is only $1,500 because you have to put up no more than 100% of the value of the stock that you're purchasing. 
So in effect, what this rule does is really eliminate small margin accounts from the industry. In fact, small margin accounts are really not appropriate. Margin accounts, as we'll see, do involve some risk. So we don't want investors who can only afford to invest a small amount of money to get involved in a risky transaction like a margin account. So this minimum rule kind of discourages small margin accounts. Now, they've set up our account, and we know what the initial requirements are in the account. And the next question would be, what would happen later as the account fluctuates in value? Now remember, our initial market value was $10,000, but that stock is not going to stay at that particular point. We're going to see some fluctuation in the value of the stock. And so, to see what happens when we get those fluctuations, let's go back to our previous example. And we're going to use this one and become very familiar with this particular case. Now remember, the customer bought initially $10,000 worth of stock, 100 shares at $100 a share. And we had to put up 50%, which is the Reg T requirement. So that's what the customer added to the account, and the broker-dealer used 50% or $5,000 of their own money to help the customer purchase the stock. Now, suppose that XYZ then increases in value to $120 per share, because we do expect some fluctuation in the value of the stock. So the total now, still 100 shares in the account, remember we haven't changed the number of shares, but now they're worth $120 per share. So notice that the account value is now $12,000. Now we have a problem, right? Notice that the left side and the right side no longer are in balance. So we have to make some other adjustment. If we change one entry, we have to change another entry to keep the two sides in balance. And those changes can't be just arbitrary. They have to fit what's actually going on. So we're going to change either this number or this number. And we need to think which one would really be changed. Well, remember, this represents the amount of money that you owe to the brokerage firm. So if your stock goes up in value, does that mean that you owe more money to the brokerage firm? And the answer to that is no. You borrowed $5,000 originally, and that is still what you owe to the brokerage firm. An increase in the value of your stock does not increase your debt to the brokerage firm. So it must be this figure that is going to change in this situation. The equity must have increased to $7,000 to keep the two sides equal. And then once again, market value equals debit balance plus equity. So the two sides are equal. So you can see that what we need to do is when we see one change at one point in this statement, we have to figure out what else should change to keep the two sides equal. It's not a balance sheet unless we keep the two sides in balance at all times. And that can help us figure out what the consequences should be. So what we've seen so far is that if the market value of the stock goes up, that in itself doesn't change the debit balance or what you owe to the broker-dealer. It's the equity that will increase in that situation. Now, let's go back to the account in which the stock has just increased in value. Ask yourself the following hypothetical question. What would Reg T require as a deposit if we were to purchase the stock in the market at this point? Now, remember, that's going to be 50% of the current market value. So $12,000, which would be what the stock would be worth today if we were going to purchase it, times 50% will give us $6,000 as the current Reg T equity requirement. Now compare that to the equity actually in the account as it's shown, which is $7,000. The account equity is $1,000 more than is required. So this amount is called excess equity. Now it's important for us to try to understand what excess equity is. Sometimes people are under the misconception that it represents a cash balance, money that you can simply draw out of the account that is your money and that is really not quite the case. A good way to think about a margin account is to use the analogy of someone purchasing a home. Let's say that you purchase a home for $100,000 and you put down a $20,000 down payment. Of course, that would be your equity, what you have put into your home. The mortgage company or the bank then would loan you the other $80,000 and you would use that to purchase the house. So now you would have a $100,000 asset but an $80,000 liability and you only have $20,000 in the house. Now, what is the value of your house? What if it suddenly rose to, let's say, $120,000? Would your mortgage increase? No. You wouldn't owe any more money to the bank than you did before. Your equity in your house would increase. Now, does that mean that there is a pile of cash somewhere in your house that you can lay your hands on? Well, of course not. All it means is that your ownership in the house now has larger equity. Now, if you sold the house and paid off your mortgage, you would have $40,000 in cash. Now, that is only one way to get access to that equity, though. 
Of course, anyone who has a home that has increased in value may know that another way to get access to that equity in your home would be to take out a second mortgage or to take out a home equity loan. Now, that is exactly what we can do with this margin account. Your stock has gone up in value, but there's only stock in your account. There is no cash there. So how can you get at that increase in the value of the stock? You can take out a loan against the stock, which now has a larger collateral value. So we're going to take a look at how that works for a margin account. The market value of our account, remember, is $12,000 in this situation. Well, $12,000 worth of stock will serve as collateral for how large a loan? A $6,000 loan. Now remember that the broker-dealer can lend you up to half the value of the stock. Now the broker-dealer has already loaned the customer, and the customer has already borrowed $5,000. That was the original debit balance. So notice that the broker-dealer could lend the customer another $1,000. The difference between what the collateral is worth and what you have actually borrowed. And you could take this loan out in cash if you wanted to do so. Now there has to be some consequences there. You've just taken out another, a smaller loan than your original one. So taking out the loan is going to increase the customer's debit balance to $6,000 because that really is a loan. That is not cash sitting in the account. As a result, the account equity would be reduced to $6,000 to keep the statement in balance. So notice in that situation, when we took cash out of the account, it wasn't like taking cash out of a savings account. What you're really doing is taking out another loan from the broker-dealer. That's great, right? You have the cash available and you can do whatever you want with the cash. But what you have to recognize is that since it was a loan, your overall debt will go up. The stock didn't change in value. So the only other thing that could change here to keep our balance sheet in balance would be the equity. And remember that you drew out a loan against some of that equity, and so now your equity has decreased in the account. In general, whenever you take cash out of a margin account, the debit balance will go up. And the opposite is also true as well. If you put cash into a margin account, the debit balance will go down. Now think about cash coming into the account as being used to pay down your loan, and therefore your debit will decrease as well in that situation. Now, one of the things that the customer could do instead of just spending the cash or using it for some other purpose is to buy some additional stock on margin if they found another stock that they thought to be a good deal in their margin account. So the question that we want to pose is, how much additional stock could the customer purchase on margin with $1,000 equity available? This amount would be called the buying power of the account. To find this figure, we would divide the excess equity, which is in fact exactly the amount of money that we could borrow from the account, by regulation T requirement, that is currently 50%. So in our example, this will be $1,000 divided by 50%, which equals $2,000 worth of buying power. So that does make sense because if I buy $2,000 worth of stock on margin, in general, how much do I have to put up under Regulation T? 50% of the value, which would be a $1,000 equity requirement in that particular case. So the buying power is something that we want to know about in the account. We could withdraw $1,000 in cash, but we could buy $2,000 worth of stock. And those are two alternatives that we have in this situation. So, how could the use of buying power affect our account? What would that do in our particular case? Again, here's our account in which the stock has increased in value. It has excess equity of $1,000. And remember, that's because the equity of $7,000 is greater than the current Reg T requirement, which is 50% of this figure, which is $6,000. The difference of $1,000 is excess equity. But $1,000 excess equity means that we have $2,000 of buying power. Now, what does it mean to have $2,000 of buying power? Well, here's the deal. It means that we could buy another $2,000 worth of stock in our account without having to deposit any additional money ourselves. So just come out and say, buy the stock. But if we did that, some things are going to change in our account. What is going to change? Well, the market value of the stock would increase by $2,000 to $14,000. Why? Because you have more stock in the account. They just bought another two grand of stock for you. In addition, the debit balance would also increase by $2,000. And notice that the account is balanced at that particular point. There is also no excess equity left and no buying power. And we can check that because notice that the current equity in the account is exactly equal to 50% of the current market value. And there isn't any excess equity in this situation. 
In fact, we've used that up. We've taken the maximum advantage of it in this particular case. So now so far, we've examined what would happen to our account if the market value of the stock that we bought had risen, had gone up. And there are a lot of nice choices that you could have. You could sell the stock at a profit. You could withdraw cash on a loan. You could buy additional stock on margin. So that's great that there are so many nice things that you could do when the market value of the stock goes up. But the problem is, unfortunately, the stock could also go the other way. So we need to understand the consequences of the market value of the stock falling as well. So let's start again with our original example. Remember that we had purchased $10,000 worth of stock, 100 shares at $100 per share, 50% equity, and 50% debit balance at $5,000 each. Now, suppose that from this position, XYZ declines to $80 per share, let's say. Now, the market value of the 100 shares in the account would then be $8,000. This would result in the equity in the account declining to $3,000. Now, why does that happen? Why don't we get a change in anything else? Because remember that the value of the loan doesn't change. Your stock went down, but you still owe the broker-dealer $5,000 for that original purchase that you made back there to set up the account. That loan account, that debt to the broker-dealer hasn't changed. So it must be our equity that declines in that situation. So when the market value goes up, that equity goes up. When the market value goes down, the equity goes down as well. The debit balance is staying constant in these situations. Now, we ask the question, if we go back to the situation, if we were now to purchase the stock on margin, the $8,000 worth of stock, what would the Reg T requirement be at this point? Well, again, Reg T is 50%. So 50% of 8,000 would be $4,000 Reg T requirement. The equity in the account is $3,000, which is $1,000 less than the current Reg T requirement. So we're sort of underwater here in terms of what we should have in the account. A margin account in which the equity is less than the current Reg T requirement is called a restricted account. Well, this sounds serious already. A customer's account is restricted. It sounds like we're going to have a real problem here, but it turns out for most customers that this is not a real big problem. You are not required, if your account is restricted, to add more money to the account to bring it up to the 50% level. In fact, if you want to, you can even buy additional stock in this account. All you have to do is meet the 50% requirement on the new purchase that you're making, not even the total account. So really the restriction is just a restriction on the broker-dealer. They can't loan you additional money on the current collateral in the account because in theory the loan is already too big. So we do have to recognize then an account is restricted but there are not a lot of negative consequences in this situation. The problem is suppose the stock continues to decline in the account. For example, here is the account when the stock had dropped to 80. Now, what would happen if the market value continues to decline in the account? Well, of course, the equity in the account will also continue to decline. Now, notice how low could that equity get? Well, as that stock keeps dropping and dropping and dropping, the equity could decline not only to zero, but also, in theory, even below. Now, what would that mean to have negative equity in the account? Well, instead of thinking about the equity, Think about the debt. Now remember, that debt is still $5,000 up there, and yet your stock is continuing to sink in value. Now remember what you had agreed to with that stock. That stock was the collateral for the loan that the broker-dealer had extended to you. And yet it's possible that the value of the stock could eventually decline below the loan that you owe to the broker-dealer. So the broker-dealers are on pretty shaky ground here because that collateral, if the broker-dealer chose to sell it, wouldn't even pay off the loan that you had taken out. So that's a serious problem for the broker-dealer. If we have too many customers in that situation and they just kind of take a walk on the broker-dealer, the broker-dealer is stuck with a loss on those types of loans. So we want to make sure that the broker-dealer maintains their financial integrity by not allowing that to happen. Now, it's important for us to see that Regulation T does not step in at this point. Regulation T is an initial requirement. Once you meet it, upon the new purchase of that stock, you are not required to meet a Reg T requirement ever again, even if the stock would sink all the way down to zero. However, there is another requirement that would be imposed at that point. Not the Fed's requirement, but it's a rule imposed by the New York Stock Exchange and the NASD, the self-regulatory agencies for the industry. So this is the NYSE NASD maintenance requirement, and it says that you must maintain equity in your account of at least 25% of the market value. 
So does the account in our last example go over this maintenance requirement? Do we wind up with a problem with it? Well, 25% of the $8,000 market value is a $2,000 maintenance requirement. But the current equity in the account is $3,000. So notice we have more equity than the maintenance requirement says that we need. So there is no maintenance call, no maintenance violation of the rule in this situation. Well, suppose, though, that the stock declines further to, say, $60 a share. This would result in a market value of $6,000. Of course, what has to change then? The equity. It's going to decline to $1,000. The maintenance requirement would then be what? 25% of the market value. So we have a $1,500 maintenance requirement. That, again, is how much equity we're supposed to have in the account. But the equity is actually only $1,000 in the account. So this account will receive a maintenance call for $500. Now the customer has to then promptly meet this call or the stock will be sold in the account to bring the account out of the maintenance problem situation. Now, what do we mean by promptly? You have to meet the call promptly. Well, this is up to the broker dealer to interpret and it does vary from case to case. Usually though, it's not gonna be more than a couple of days. And if the stock is falling rapidly and endangering the loan and the collateral that the broker dealer is holding, Promptly may mean this afternoon. Okay, well, if you can't bring the money in, then they're going to sell the stock in the account to protect their loan, and the broker-dealers have the right to do that. So the maintenance call is the case where the customer will have to add more money to the account because there is not enough equity in the account at this particular point. Now, another thing we should be able to determine, given this maintenance problem rule, is the point at which we would start having a maintenance call issued on the account. So we want to know where that maintenance call would occur. Well, remember that when the account looked like this, there was no call because the equity of $3,000 was greater than the maintenance requirement, which was 25% of $8,000. So we had more equity than the minimum needed. But when the stock had fallen to 60, having the account look like this, there was a $500 call in this case because our maintenance requirement was 25% of $6,000 or $1,500 and we only had $1,000 of equity. So the question we're posing is, at what market value was the account at the minimum maintenance requirement? It was somewhere between 80 and 60. Well, we crossed over that line and started to get maintenance calls. So to find that value, what we concentrate on is actually the debit balance in that account of $5,000. Multiply that by four thirds. The result in this case is $6,667 of market value. So what this says is that if the market value in this account falls to 6667, you will be exactly at the maintenance level. Any further decline, you will get a maintenance call. Now to show that that is the way it works, let's assume that our account does have a market value of 6667. Notice we still have our $5,000 debit balance and so our equity is 1667. Well, what is 25% of 6667? Well, again, that also is 1667. So 25% of this figure is going to turn out to be exactly what the equity in our account is. So you can see that this is the maintenance level. If the stock declines by one more dollar, you're going to get a maintenance call. So they're very strict about that level of maintenance. And we can tell the customer when they initially take this position where that level is going to be so that they're aware of when their account is going to run into trouble. Now, sometimes problems can occur in the account given the rules that we've already looked at because we have three or four basic rules, three that we've looked at so far, applying to the margin account. Let's look at an example as to how some of these discrepancies and problems can happen. Now here we have a situation in which an investor has just purchased $20,000 worth of stock on margin. Again, a $10,000 or 50% equity deposit, $10,000 of debit balance owed to the broker dealer. Now, suppose the value of the stock in the account now rises, let's say to $24,000 as an example. Now, what will happen in the account in addition to that? Well, the equity will change as well. Now, remember, the debit won't change. When the market value goes up, the equity will change. And in this case, it will go to what? $14,000. Now, the Reg T requirement on the current market value would be what? 50% times $24,000 or $12,000 as the current Reg T requirement. So notice that we have $2,000 of excess equity in the account as it stands. Now, if the customer knows, and of course we would tell the customer that there is $2,000 of excess equity in the account, the customer has a whole variety of choices. We could just leave the account as it is. 
or we could withdraw $2,000 cash from the account, remembering though that that's a loan really. If you take out the cash, then you're going to have a higher debt and of course they are charging you interest on your debit balance. So a higher debit balance means a higher interest charge to you. So generally we probably wouldn't want to borrow the money unless we really needed it for a particular reason because if we take the money out, they're going to charge us additional interest on the debit balance in the account. But those are your choices. Leave the account alone, maybe use it for buying power, or take it out as a cash loan. Now given those choices again, let's take a look at an account to figure out what might happen in a couple of different scenarios given the decision that we would have to make. What would happen if we did choose to withdraw the excess equity from the account, remembering that it's just really a loan? Well, if drawing cash from a margin account will increase the debit balance by the amount of the withdrawal, remember, money out, debit up, and decrease the equity the same amount. Now, the account has no excess equity at that point once we've made the withdrawal. So at the top of the screen is an account from which we have not taken a withdrawal, while our account at the bottom of the screen that's what it would look like if we did take the cash withdrawal. So now those are two choices we have. Do what's at the top and leave it alone, or do what's at the bottom and take out the cash. Now if we have those two choices, here is one of the problems that we can get into. Consider that what you might do, top screen is alternative one, or you might do two and bottom screen is alternative two, and you take the cash loan. Suppose that the stock declines in value and we're going to have to drop back to the original $20,000 stock value. And we want to figure out what can happen with either of these alternatives. So this will happen in both accounts and therefore the equity would also have to decline by $4,000 in the two alternative situations, kind of two alternative universes that we're in. In the first example, the result is an account with no excess equity because notice that the stock has dropped back to its original value. Well, in the second example, the account becomes restricted. Now does this mean that in the second case if we have previously taken the withdrawal that we would have to put that $2,000 cash loan back into the account? Well, the answer is no, because the lower account is not below the maintenance level. The only time that you have to put cash back into the account is when it violates the maintenance requirement. And notice that this $8,000 of equity is still far above the 25% of $20,000. So we are able to keep this $2,000 loan that we previously made without a problem even though our account is restricted. Now the problem is, if we had not taken that withdrawal and we had simply left our account alone as it originally was, could we now go back to our broker dealer and say, well, you would have given me a loan previously, can you give me a loan now in the account that it looks like this? And the answer would be no. Notice that there is no equity excess anymore. There was when the stock was higher, but there is no longer excess equity at this point. So the customer has a dilemma. If I know that I have excess equity in my account and I don't withdraw it from my account as a loan, then later if the excess equity disappears, I lose access to that line of credit, that money I could have borrowed. If I do take the loan and my stock drops later on, even if it causes a restricted account, I don't have to put the loan back as long as I don't violate the maintenance requirement. On the other hand, that might cause a customer to say, well, if there is excess equity, I better get it out of there and take the loan because later it might not be available to me. But the trouble is that I may be borrowing money that I don't really need and therefore incurring interest charges that I don't really find any good use for. So we might encourage customers then to do things that are not in their best interest if we have the account set up with this dilemma present for the customer. Take the excess equity or not, find that it's gone later or have the cash available to us now. So what can we do to solve this problem? Well, there is a system that has been set up to resolve this particular dilemma. The Federal Reserve Board rules permit the following. If an account shows excess equity as it does here in our example, we can write ourselves a note. Okay, we're just going to call this a note. Think of this as a note that you stick up right on the side of your margin ledger where you're calculating these figures. Now, later suppose that the market value of the stock declines. Again, let's assume that it drops to that $20,000 figure that we were looking at earlier. Of course, the equity will also decline by $4,000, in this case, down to $10,000. Now, notice that we no longer have excess equity in the account. The equity is exactly 50% of the market value, no excess. However, notice that the note that we wrote to ourselves will remain on our records. 
Now, what Fed rules permit is that if this note is on the account because the broker-dealer has used this system, it's really like a reminder to the broker-dealer that at some point in the past, there was excess equity in this account. The customer could have taken out a loan back then. But rather than really forcing them to take a loan at that point, will allow them to take that loan now, even though there is no more excess equity in the account at this point. The note reminds us of what that past performance of the account was like, and the customer previously did have the privilege, if they wanted to take it, of withdrawing that cash. So what happens then if we use this privilege? The ability to take that loan even though there is no excess equity. Again, the note reminds us that the $2,000 of excess equity could be withdrawn at this point. Suppose the customer makes the withdrawal. They're going to take out that loan in cash. Now remember, anytime cash is withdrawn from a margin account, no matter what the reason, the debit balance must increase by that amount. So that is going to go up to $12,000. Now this will cause the equity to decline by the same amount. Now remember, our market value isn't changing right now in this assumption. It has already gone down to $20,000. So in this case, the account becomes restricted. Nevertheless, the withdrawal can still proceed even though the account has become restricted. However, since we have withdrawn the amount of the note, we must reduce the note by $2,000 as well. Now, the name for this accounting technique, this kind of reminder system of what the account performance did look like and what your privileges were in the past, is called a special memorandum account, or SMA. Now, an SMA then can be very helpful to a customer. If there is an SMA note on the account, no matter what the current status of the account is, we could still take a withdrawal from the account. Remember, that is a loan up to the amount of the note. Now, I do want to mention that there is one exception. There's always an exception. Now, one exception is that you can't cause a maintenance violation by using this withdrawal. You can't go below 25% equity. But usually, if the account is high, even if it becomes restricted, that's okay. But you just can't drop below the maintenance level. So what the SMA does is it allows us to take advantage of excess equity in the future that is available now without being forced to withdraw out of fear that the excess equity might disappear sometime in the future. We'll be able to use that excess equity even if the stock in the account drops in value in the future. So we would say in general that SMA preserves borrowing power in the account. If the market value declines, the SMA will remain and we can borrow against the account anyway. Now, actually, there are several ways to create SMA that we've just looked at one of the main ways of doing that, but we should note that there are other ways to create SMA. Now, the primary one that we did look at was excess equity. That will create an SMA entry in the account. But remember, a decrease in excess equity will not cause the SMA to decline. In addition, if cash, which is not needed to meet a call, is added to the account, the SMA will increase by that amount. Another method of increasing SMA is to add fully paid stock to the account. Now, recall, however, that one can borrow only one-half the value of stock that is marginable, so adding fully paid stock to a margin account will increase SMA by 50% of the value of the stock, not the full amount. A similar rule allows us to increase SMA whenever stock is sold in a margin account. In that case, SMA will increase by 50% of the value of the stock that is sold. Now, we've been discussing so far in our margin account discussion, long margin accounts. Remember, that's the case where the customer is buying the stock on margin. So they are the owners of the stock, even though the broker-dealer has a lien against it, and we're using it to back up the loan from the broker-dealer. But there are other transactions that can occur in a margin account as well. And one of the primary ones that we want to review here briefly is the short sale. In fact, short sales must occur in a margin account, and we'll take a look at why that's the case. Now, what is a short sale, first of all? Well, remember, a short sale is a case where a customer is going to borrow stock and then sell the borrowed stock. They're hoping that the stock will fall, creating a profit if we can replace the borrowed stock more cheaply. But we should look at the mechanism for the short sale to try to figure out why and how does this work? Who's involved? Who should lend us the stock? So how is a short sale actually executed? Well, here we have a customer who wants to sell short 100 shares of ABC Corporation, so they're going to give their order to their broker-dealer. Now, the broker-dealer, will assume, might not have the stock, and the customer certainly doesn't have the stock, so we're going to go out and try to borrow the stock from someone. So the stock lender who will provide this stock to us is going to lend us the shares, and often this is an institutional investor like a mutual fund. 
Now, why would a stock lender just loan us the shares? Are they just doing it to be nice? Well, no, they do get something out of the deal. In return, they receive cash equal to the current market value of the stock that they have loaned. So remember, the lender has just loaned you shares, but they get to use that cash, which is the collateral for the stock loan, as long as you have the stock borrowed. And of course, at some time in the future, you must return the stock loan to the stock lender, and then they'll give back the cash collateral. Now, the broker-dealer, of course, immediately sells the stock in the open market to some other buyer who then pays the current market value for the stock. The customer's account will then be credited with the proceeds of the sale. Now, let's assume that ABC is currently selling at $80 a share. So that means that the proceeds credited to this account would be $8,000. So that's a credit balance, cash credited to the account. The problem is, that's not just a credit balance that you can take out any time that you want. Now remember, you still owe someone stock, so you can't just take that cash out of your account. The only thing that will let you use the credit balance for is to repurchase the stock in the open market when you need to repay the lender the stock that you have borrowed. So we're going to have to do that at some point in the future. Now, what if the stock falls in value from $80 to $70 per share? The customer could use $7,000 of the $8,000 credit to repurchase and return the 100 shares to the stock lender and then they would have no further obligation and the $1,000 remaining in the account is profit to the short seller. So we can see that what we did is to bring in a certain amount of cash from selling the borrowed shares and then we waited for the stock to fall, then we replaced those borrowed shares with cheaper stock. That's not cheating. That's okay because you owe stock, not cash to someone. Now, as long as you replace the borrowed shares with any 100 shares that you can find, no matter what it costs you to acquire them, you've satisfied your obligation to the stock lender. So we can see farther down the stock goes, the greater profit opportunity there is for that short seller. Now to understand how this account works, we're going to set up a diagram similar to the one we used for long margin accounts. In this case, let's start with the liability section. If we sell short 100 shares of ABC at $80 per share, what do we owe? What is our liability? In the short sale liability, we owe stock to the stock lender. It's those 100 shares of ABC that really is our liability. The dollar value of that liability is the market value of the stock. In other words, what would it cost us at this point to buy back the shares in the open market and return them to the lender? Well, at this point, it's $8,000 called a short market value, or SMV. But later, this value will fluctuate as the stock rises and falls in the market. So this figure is not always going to be $8,000, but it is for our initial setup. Well, next, what is the equity in our account? Well, initially, it is the amount deposited by the short seller, the Regulation T requirement of 50% of the market value. In this particular case, that would be $4,000, 50% of the market value of $8,000. Now, that is because we have to put some cash into the account ourselves. We're not allowed just to do a short sale and not put any of the customer's own cash up at risk. What is on the asset side of the account? That would be cash as represented by a credit balance in the account. $8,000 of cash from the short sale plus the customer's Reg T requirement of $4,000 gives us a credit balance of $12,000 in the account. So in the short account, the credit balance should always equal the short market value plus the equity in the account which is just another illustration of our basic balance sheet equation. Now, let's use this diagram to show what happens in a short account when a stock fluctuates. We'll start with the example that we have just set up. The stock was sold short at $80 per share. Assume that the stock now falls to 70. The short market value of 100 ABC is now $7,000. Now, this change in market value will not affect the credit balance. Just think of that as a pile of cash. So to keep the statement balanced, the equity must increase to $5,000. What happens if the stock moves against the investor? Again, we begin by shorting the stock at $80 per share, our original situation. When the stock rises to $90 per share, so the short market value will rise to $9,000 as a result, equity will decline to $3,000 in the account. So in a short account, as the short market value falls, the equity goes up, whereas when the short market value rises, the equity falls. So we need to keep those movements in mind in the account. Now notice the credit balance, which is just that 
pile of cash credited to our account is not changing in our particular situation. Now, so far, we've looked at one rule governing short sales, the Regulation T margin requirement of 50%. Now, that's the Federal Reserve Board rule. Notice that it's exactly the same rule that we saw in a long margin account, but in addition, as in the long margin account, there is also an initial equity requirement from the self-regulatory organizations that must be met when you open a short position, and that is the initial minimum equity is $2,000, period. Now, we emphasize that because there is no exception for short sales that are under $2,000 like there was for a long purchase. No matter how small an amount of stock you sell short, you must always put at least $2,000 of equity in the account, and that is related to the problem of potential losses. No matter how small an amount of stock you sell short, the losses could be very large. In fact, theoretically unlimited. So $2,000 period is the minimum for the short account. Now these two requirements apply each time a client takes a new position in the account. Might a short seller later be asked for additional margin? Let's go back to the example and see. Here's our account after the short sale of 100 shares at $80. Suppose that the stock rises to $90. The short market value will increase to $9,000 and the equity will decline to $3,000. Notice the constant credit balance here. So we can see that as the stock rises, the investor equity falls, which really means that the position is beginning to lose money. But how great could those losses be? Could the investor lose more than their original Reg T deposit? Notice that the higher the stock rises, the greater the loss on the short sale. Since there is no limit to how high that stock can go, there is no theoretical limit to the investor's loss on a short sale. So notice that as the short market value keeps going up, the investor's equity is disappearing. So that's going to have some negative consequences at some point. Eventually, the broker-dealer will demand an additional deposit of money to bring the equity up to a reasonable level. This would be a maintenance requirement for the short account. And in this situation, of course, it's a self-regulatory rule. The short maintenance requirement is 30% of the short market value of the stock. That's the minimum equity that we should have in the account. Now, although this is the rule that we will use in our example, you should note that this is generally the short maintenance requirement. Now, don't you just hate words like that and, and rules generally? You know that lurking behind there is something else that you're going to need to know, and that's certainly the case here. You should look up in your manual the full text of the rule, even though this is the part of the rule that you'll use the most. You do have to know about the full rule and not just the general part. And the only time that you need to worry about the rest of the rule is if we're dealing with low price stock. But the requirement is generally what we'll be using. So we're going to take a look at some examples in which that particular requirement would apply. So let's take a look at the following case and see if a maintenance call would be issued. $12,000 credit balance, $9,000 short market value. Now remember that the short maintenance requirement is generally 30% of the short market value. And that would be 30 times this figure. But don't forget that this is not a long margin account. So don't take 30% of this number. It's 30% of the market value, which is over here in a short account. So in this example, that would be $2,700 as the requirement but the actual equity in the account is $3,000. So that does exceed the minimum required equity. So there's going to be no call issued in this situation. So let's check another account. Again, in this situation, we would say, what's 30% of the short market value, which in this account would give us a requirement of $3,000. So we're supposed to have at least $3,000 of equity in the account. We actually have equity of only $2,000. Therefore, the broker-dealer will issue a maintenance call for $1,000 for this short margin account. Now well, that wraps up our discussion on advanced option strategies and margin accounts. I hope you join us for all of the programs in the Series 7. And remember to contact your local STC branch for help. If you would like additional materials, call 1-800-STC-1223. Thank you from Securities Training Corporation.